In this lesson, we're looking at stratified sampling, but specifically errors, bias, data presentation and analysis, which is the back end of this particular syllabus dot point about stratified sampling. So we've evaluated stratified sampling and we've discussed some of the positives and negatives of it, but knowing that it is a really good way to sample an ecosystem, it's important to do it correctly. Sampling bias is going to occur when the design of the sample leads to some species in an ecosystem having a lower or higher sampling probability than others. And the resulting data that is collected is considered biased, right? It's a biased sample. Now, non-random samples are biased because not all individuals are equally likely uh, at having a chance of being selected. So this is a very clear um, convenience sample and therefore is a biased sample. And these samples may not be truly representative of the entire ecosystem being sampled. Now, the aim of good sampling design is to minimize this bias. And if there's systematic error in the sampling process, the data collected can skew the snapshot of the ecosystem. To minimize bias, we want to collect large numbers of samples, right? The more samples, the more reliable the mean is, and therefore the more representative of the community. We want to use a random number generator when we're talking about random sampling, so selecting a grid coordinate to sample. We want to have consistent counting criteria, so you might talk about rules of counting around um, a quadrat. You might take the top line uh, and the right line, but not the bottom and the left line, and that has to be consistent with all people. You have to select and use equipment correctly and appropriately. So obviously this is going to depend on the context, but it's going to allow for sample reliability and eliminate systemic bias or systematic bias, sorry. And you also want to calibrate your instruments. Now, I know that sounds really well, obvious, right? Um, but as the quality of the data is really dependent on the equipment that's you know being used to take those measurements, it has to be accurate and precise. So you're talking about calibrating your data sensors and things like that. The precision of the instrument should also be noted um, so that they're not used outside their level of resolution. Now, error is going to happen in any experimental or sampling method, regardless of how careful you're going to be. So some environmental variables can be controlled. So the aim, uh, sorry, can't be controlled, but the aim is that you are trying to control everything you can as the sampler. Error impacts on the reliability and the validity of the sampling. Some types of errors that you really can't control too much you might get chance sample fluctuations. So you might be talking about, you know, clump distribution or something like that. Incorrect recording of data is something that can be controlled, obviously. Bias samples from non-random sampling designs, that sampling design really needs to be sorted out early. Defective instrumentation is obviously going to be a problem, right? So the reliability is impacted when multiple instruments are used, multiple people are in the same area doing the same task. Uh, identifying uh, different plants in a different way as well. The validity of the test is going to be impacted with things like sampling design, misidentification of species, or even a disproportionate sampling in a stratified sampling scenario. Now, if data is collected accurately with minimal bias and error, it's important to accurately then depict the findings as well, right? Choosing appropriate presentation methods for the data um, has to represent a complex community can be really hard to do and the goal is to avoid misrepresenting what was found during sampling and uh, mislead the interpretation then. So we're talking about things like data tables, profile diagrams, kite graphs, bar graphs, scatter graphs. Talking about tables to start with, this is one straight out of Pearson and it shows quite a bit of information. When you're doing up a data table in the field, it's really important to include the date, the site that you're also working at, uh, this one's got distance along the transect line that you're working from as well. Uh, you want to also be looking at the vegetation type. You might then need to be able to classify it using specs. Uh, you want to take some abiotic readings. So in this particular case, you've got these abiotic readings. Uh, you need to consider, say, land information as well. If you want to be drawing a, a profile diagram, it might be also helpful to include the soil type or the slope. Any other information and notes needs to come in here, and that might include things like photographs and really identifying what it is so you don't come back with a thousand photographs of I don't know what. Now, kite graphs are really interesting because uh, they uh, show spatial changes along a transect, and they're really effective ways to show distribution and abundance, right? That's what they're there for, and it's along that gradient. It might be a really easy one. In this case, it's a distance from a footpath, so you might be talking distance from a disturbance. 
Now, each kite shape, so let's just call this the kite shape, these little things here, um, they're showing abundance and distribution. So the distribution will be along this line, and the abundance is shown by how wide that kite shape is. So, for example, in this first diagram, this x-axis here, obviously distance from the footpath, and then the width of the shape relative uh, is the relative abundance there. Same thing for plants, right? Distance along the transects um, and the abundance at the various locations. Profile diagrams are scale drawings of a profile or a side view. It's also called an elevation and it looks at the vegetation or also the land shape along a particular area. Uh, they show both the shape of the land uh, and the horizontal strata of vegetation. So it's so really important that scale is done properly here. It's got to be representative, um, but otherwise they're a really good visual comparison between different types of vegetation. Graphs, in this case bar graphs, um, include areas or strata or different species in this case. Um, error needs to be considered, right? You're averaging uh, different things. You've got to consider the standard error which indicates the likely accuracy of the mean. So if we're comparing two different ecosystems, then you can use your t-test and p-values, and we know that that error can give an indication, not an absolute, but an indication of whether there is statistical significance between these two different areas. Scatter plots are used to graph relationships and identify correlation uh, between the variables. So in this case, uh, antibiotic and the yield, right? It might be talking about soil salinity and the tree height. Um, in ecology, they can be used to display changes over that gradient as well, like distance or abiotic gradients like light intensity. Uh, it can be a really good visual representation of a trend or a relationship between the variables. And then you can use a, a correlation coefficient, R squared, uh, to determine uh, you know, whether that strength of the relationship is, is strong or not. Error bars also can be included where you have made mean calculations and plotted them. Right, so this is all about bias and error and methods of data presentation in stratified sampling specifically.